So, my name is Stuart Gaines and I'm with Maker Fair and we've been having a really interesting set of seminars today punctuated with uh, laser light shows. This is going to be the last presentation and then later on at 6 o'clock there's a O'Reilly uh, O'Reilly tradition called Ignite which really is a set of uh, uh, five minute presentations that people make. Is on? So, I guess we're not uh, on anyway, but for our last presentation, uh, we really want to focus on education and learning. And uh, I'm privileged to be introducing a group called Hands on Minds. And these are people who uh, work, have organized seminars for educators and students to look into. All right, well, Andrew, family had a good time. I think they're going to explain to us what that means. And uh, they're going to make a, they're going to have a short presentation, and then we're really going to encourage you guys to ask questions here in the audience. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Charles, and he's going to do the more formal introductions of his colleagues. Hi everyone. How are you? Good to be here. Good to be at the fair. Uh, I'll say a little bit about who we are, and uh, then we're going to ask uh, my two colleagues to say a little bit about uh, the Maker Fair and our work, and some connections, and we'll leave some time at the end for some questions you might have. Okay. Good. Uh, my name is Charlie Majowski, and I work with an organization called Big Picture Learning. Big Picture Learning starts schools all over the country and around the world, very different kinds of high schools and secondary schools. Uh, and my colleagues, Elliot Washer and Dr. Frank Wilson, are uh, working with Big Picture as well. And uh, for the last day and a half, we've been here, while the Maker Fair has been going on, we've been working on the topic of how do we bring making into schools. How do we bring hand-mind learning into schools? And as part of our work for inspiration, we attended the Maker Fair. The group we brought in, about a dozen and a half people, spent about a few hours this morning roaming around the Maker Fair, seeing what we could learn by looking at actual makers doing things and then thinking about what that meant for what schools could do to bring making to all kids of all ages. And so what we're going to do is share a few observations about what we saw when we went there. And then we'll talk a little bit about what we think those things mean for schools. And then we'll talk about maybe some next steps that we think we might be able to take in terms of bringing schools and making and maker fair together more. Okay? So I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Elliot Washer, uh, to start, and then to uh, oh, Frank. You want to start since you're holding the mic? Okay. Well, we actually, we will have mics. Uh, everybody's got mics. Um, well, I'm actually a little curious to know about who's sitting out here. We, we don't actually have to see you because there's a bright light, but um, sort of curious to know um, are there any either teachers here or people who are involved in making who, who teach other people to do what they're doing? See any hands? Great. Uh, so, uh, I think maybe it would be good if Elliot told people a little bit about um, uh, the, the Big Picture Schools and, and uh, how he and I got connected. Uh, I'm actually uh, a retired neurologist. I practiced in California for most of my career uh, in private practice and then at the University of California in San Francisco and at Stanford, and I met Elliot, uh, and after I met Elliot, I got really excited about what he was doing, so maybe you could talk a little bit about it. Uh, sure, well, about uh, 15 years ago, uh, we started our first school in Providence, Rhode Island, we now have 120 small schools around the United States, in Canada, New Zealand, and Australia. Uh, our schools are very, very different, and not just that they're small, but we start with the interests of each and every student. And usually, that interest is around um, the arts and in making things. And twice, or, uh, twice a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays, our students are out of school working with people who they've selected uh, around their interests to learn from them. And our teachers who are advisors over four years, go out, organize uh, a curriculum for each and every student around their interests, bringing in 
academics uh, at the right times. And lo and behold, the students who were disengaged with school and board are all of a sudden very, very excited and feel that they are learners. And so we came uh, to the Maker Fair, and I met Frank 15 years ago, really about 12, when he wrote a book called The Hand. And we met in a gambling casino <laughs> in uh, Reno, Nevada, and uh, I don't gamble, so that's hard to do. But uh, he was carrying a book around by uh, a colleague of ours, uh, Seymour Saracen, who recently passed away. And I said, well, what are you doing with that book? And he says, well, I'm reading it because I'm writing this other book. And I said, well, that book that you're writing is kind of what we're doing in practice. And the book that he wrote about, um, put forward, and I'll say it quickly, and Frank will talk to you about it more, a thesis that said, basically, uh, this and this about together, they're not separate. And this thinks, lo and behold, and I got uh, two million, we all do two million years of evolution, it says that it does. And yet it's bifurcated in our schools and they're very, very much hands off, don't touch places. Well, how can you learn if you can't touch? And so Frank and I developed a, a friendship over a dozen years and he's on our board and helps get into our schools and influence our schools even more and in better ways uh, than they were uh, before he got involved with us. And so basically, that's it. We came to the Maker Fair, and I met Dale the same way. I called him up, and I said, I went to the Maker Fair in San Mateo, and I said, this is an incredible thing, except it's an event. What do you do after the event? And what happens with our young people after an event like this? Well, they may have great parents, but what are they doing locked up in school all the time? when they can't explore and experiment and use their hands and use their minds and use their hearts, and they're not out in the community and they're not connected to adults whom they want to learn from. So we decided to conduct a symposium here by bringing in craftspeople from all over the country, and engineers, and designers, and artists, and Frank was a doctor, and policy people, and our students as well. And we went from our students and started with their stories and developed something that we'll talk to you about today. So, Frank, you can tell me a little bit about um, the work that you do, I guess. And so we get a little bit of a background from Frank, because uh, I just gave you a brief thing. We'll start talking about what happened at the symposium. Um, OK. Um, the, um, the beginning of my interest, I guess, in the relationship between the hand and the mind started um, when my kids were young and both in school. And um, my son was really handy, liked to build stuff. He used to take little corks from wine bottles uh, from our house and put toothpicks in them and make sailing chips out of them. Um, a lot of stuff like that. He's actually now very grown up and he, um, for the last four years, has been rebuilding a derelict church in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, turning it into a community center. He's got a job with the Newark Housing Authority, and he goes down to Atlanta on weekends, and he puts on overalls, and, and has been building this place. Um, our daughter uh, started out in music, and it was when she was about 12 years old that I saw her practicing. Uh, she used to practice for recitals, and, and uh, I noticed She'd been doing this for six or seven years, which is about when, if kids are really interested in music, they really start getting good. And I noticed that I couldn't even see her fingers, they were going so fast. And I said, I wonder how you do that. And I thought maybe as a neurologist, I should know more about that. So that really became the beginning of my interest about what, um, what is special about the human brain that predisposes us to do things with our hands. And that was in the early 1980s. And about 10 years later, I became uh, particularly interested in musicians professionally at a higher level, uh, started seeing musicians as patients. And I started thinking about why it is that musicians are so passionate about what they do. Uh, I, I thought at first, well, maybe it's just because they're professional emoters. But um, then I started interviewing other people, uh, people who train horses, people who uh, uh, 
rock climb, uh, people who build things. Um, there was a magician, there was a juggler. And all of these people at around the age of 11 or 12, and this was, the, this was the thing that really got me going, at around the age of 11 or 12 had seen an adult doing something that just caught the, just got their attention. And they looked at what the adult was doing, and they said, that's really what I want to do. And it wasn't just a, a kid's fantasy. It turned out that they built the whole life around what they were doing. So it seemed to me that there was something very important um, that I'd never heard anybody talk about, which was that if you build your life around what you do with your hands, if you make the hands the basis for uh, the way you communicate with other people, the way you think about yourself, then it's really uh, extraordinary. And the, the thing that was most impressive to me was that people just couldn't stand to be away from work. And uh, I saw a lot of people who didn't want to go to work, but people whose lives really depended on what they did with their hands just couldn't stand not to be working and doing what it was that they loved to do. So that was really the beginning of what turned out to be a 10-year period of research for me. And it was kind of what Elliot said, that uh, it turns out, um, and I have a lot of anthropologists and psychologists to thank for this, um, that made me understand that one of the things that make human beings unique is the capacity that we have to engage the world and to develop ourselves as individuals, independent, autonomous, creative individuals because of what our hands are able to do. And we don't have time enough to talk about that. Um, there's a book that I wrote about that, which is going to be available as an e-book next month called The Hand. Um, maybe you'll be able to buy a chapter for 99 cents, like a song, if you're interested. But the point is, I spent a lot of my career thinking about this. And when I, Elliot and I met and we talked about this, and I realized that he had built a school, which wasn't a music school, it wasn't an anything specific vocational school, it was just that no matter what else happened, these kids were going to connect with themselves and with other people by learning how to do something and their hands and objects that they created were going to be part of it. And over the years, as I've gone to the schools, we started out, there was one school in Providence, Rhode Island, and they're now around the world. There are some 80 schools or so. And I've visited a bunch of these schools. I've met a bunch of these kids. And these are all at-risk kids who were failing in school or alienated from school. And they are not, when they get into these programs, um, I don't know what the statistics are for the country. Uh, in big cities, maybe 50% of kids who start high school finish. In these schools, 90% of them who start finish. And 95% of those kids go to college. And everybody says, well, this is just vocational stuff. You learn how to use tools and stuff. But it isn't. Uh, it's, it could be if you want it to be, but some of these kids uh, may want to go on and go into physics. Uh, they may want to go on and go into uh, uh, other, other kinds of careers that require a lot of academic learning. You never know at the age of 12 or 13 or 14. So anyway, I'm uh, at this point enormously enthusiastic about this and we came here because we've been talking with Dale about what is it about making stuff that's so nourishing to people, to relationships, so stimulating to the imagination and so fulfilling on a on really a lifetime basis. Um, that's kind of my pitch. Uh, and I didn't make it up. I just had the benefit of seeing these ideas confirmed over and over and over again. Uh, we had a bunch of kids from these schools here this week. Uh, and it happened again. They tell us and show us the stuff that they're working on. And it's amazing. I wonder, Elliot and Frank, if you can, based on all of that, reflect on what the team, what our team saw when they visited the fair this morning, some observations they made, reflect back on what they told us that impressed them so much uh, as they visited. Oh, my turn. Okay. Well, well what we did uh, to start off this morning was well, we went to the fair. Uh, and we, had, we started asking makers out there, uh, 
How did that connect it to make it? Uh, was it in school? Was it not in school? Was it through their family? And we got a lot of response that said, yep, it was through somebody in my family. Yep, it was an all, a personal interest and I just kept on working and working at it to get better. Uh, yeah, I had this interest and I found this uh, actors group or this quartz group or a group in the community where I felt like I could be me and carry out the things that I like to do. And uh, those were very, very uh, powerful for us because we're searching and trying to really figure out as a, a nonprofit organization, this big picture, uh, whether or not this work actually belongs in schools and what the function and purpose of schooling is and how narrow the measures are in schools now that don't allow kids to figure out who they are in the world and the things that they really, really like to do that can motivate them intrinsically to learn. So we saw um, a lot of evidence around, aha, it's really going on outside. Now is it really going on inside? And we weren't hearing that uh, from the people that we interviewed. And so we're going to get through an evolution of progression, but Frank, what did, what did uh, what are some of the things that you saw? I'm leaving out a few things, so hopefully you can talk about them. Um, if you don't, I will. <laughs> well, one of the things that, that impresses me uh, and impressed me today uh, just walking around was uh, the, uh, the enormous uh, interest in just these objects. Um, and I was actually thinking about um, the, the robotics stuff that uh, there's, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of other stuff as well, but um, I was really interested in the robotics stuff because we've currently uh, recently been interested in how we encourage kids to become interested in science. There are some, uh, there, there are some um, very, very high level uh, science represented by some things that the military had here. Um, you, you saw where the Hummers were, I'm sure, and, and uh, uh, some of the stuff that the military is using for defusing bombs and so forth. But some of it, it's interesting that um, recently um, a lot of people, including people who are not formally involved in this work, um, have been thinking about the replacement of missing arms and legs uh, in people who've been injured. Uh, in the conflicts that we've been involved in in the Middle East. And uh, I'm very interested to see that uh, one of the themes that's really strong here is uh, creating these, these little devices that have complex mechanics and that are being remotely controlled. Um, there is a big effort around the country now uh, to take some of that interest and the ability that gets better and better at miniaturizing things and at establishing more complicated control mechanisms to use that to improve the prosthetic replacements. And we are now actually beginning to introduce uh, prosthetics as an introduction to science and engineering and technical education in our schools. Um, I'm only mentioning that right now because um, Mr. Doherty asked me to, to bring that up. Uh, and I'm hoping um, that as a result of some of the things that have happened here and that will be happening at the New York Maker Faire, uh, that we're going to find more people in the community. And, and, and I think that's one of our objectives, is we're really interested in finding the, the people in the community who are interested in working with students uh, to, to get them uh, to begin to acquire the skills that they need. And we, it isn't just a learning thing because we've discovered from how good kids are that the likelihood is that some of the big breakthroughs uh, are going to come from young kids uh, who are not burdened with the knowledge of stuff that doesn't work. Uh, and they're, they're really passionate and they're crazy. And, and uh, so we've already got some evidence uh, that that's happening. Charlie, we're getting close. 
got a few more minutes left. I did notice this morning as I walked around that there were lots of kids from schools who saw their shirts on, so I decided to ask some of them where they did this work, and I think this reflects on what Elliot was saying earlier, that most of them did this as after-school work. It wasn't the work they did in school, it was after-school clubs, and they had their shirts on from their clubs, and they were doing all the robotics work and other kinds of things. But I, I guess, Elliot, I would ask you then, how do we start bringing some of that after-school work into the, during the school work, so to speak? Well, I, I think it's, I'm, I don't know if I can answer that question about it because it's a, it was a little different judging on the observations that I saw. When you went into the soldering room, you saw grandmas and four-year-olds with, with soldering guns in their hands. And you saw the relational aspect of a little child looking over the shoulder of an older brother or sister starting to solder with a person that they knew on their lap. All right, now that's very, very old and that's very much who we are biologically and relationally. And, and those kinds of experiences have to be captured inside of schools, which means you have to know your teachers well, people have to know how to do those things, that over the shoulder or side-by-side -side learning is not what happens. This is what happens in schools. Somebody up here, and it's out there. But it's not, let me show you how to do this, or facing this way, when you turn around. That's a different type of learning. That's a different type of how we were, how we were made and created to learn. In order to change schools, you have to create those environments. What we did this afternoon, as four different groups, and we, I thought we were very successful at it, was that we did create those environments as places inside of school, connected to communities and other places outside of school. So it wasn't that there was a wall up between the community and the school, that students were going inside out, outside in, they were going on the internet to get off the internet, we don't want them, as, as our group is talking, we don't want people on the internet all the time. We want them to have, get their hands filled with stuff because we live in a three-dimensional world, not a two-dimensional world. We don't call it a screen for nothing. So you got to get off, get on, talk to people, have a relationship, and really feel that work. And if you're not doing that, there's something off. And when they put you on online in school and it's just the same memorization stuff that you got out of the book. Once again, you're in trouble using the internet in ways that are only very narrow, just like schools are testing in very, very narrow ways. But it's all social networking that's going on out there, all ways to figure out how to do stuff that's going on on the internet that you gotta get off of. That's what we were looking for. That's some of the things that we found. What if we took a few questions? I will meet. Maybe we have some questions that you'd like to direct to Elliot or Frank. Yes, sir? I just spent the last eight hours sitting in front of the uh, bigger shed and pushing the solder, especially the girls. Yes. That come in. Do you know how to solder? I bet you want to know how to solder. One dollar is the best kit, best bargain here at the show. And they go in, they're a little hesitant, they dabble, pay the dollar, you know, sign the waiver. They'll go in there, they'll come out, and they got the biggest grin on their face when their little thing that they're wearing is pulsating, that little badge that they made for yep. a dollar. And I, I, I bought it for them. God, to work. Hey, who did your dad do it for you? Yep. No, I think it's dead. Oh, wow, you know how to solder now. Are you going to be signing? I think that, you know, this is an event, and that's eventful. They won't forget that. Now, that should happen every day in school. That's the, that's the difference. That's the experience that we're with. You can't do soldering in the school, the elementary school kids. They, the, they worry about lawsuits. You can in some of our schools, because I know some of the people out there. So, don't tell them. 
No, we have a principal. <laughs> Yeah. Question back there? Right. There are two levels of learning. One. I don't know if there's a mic up Yeah. There are two parts of learning. One is getting the tools, and the next is knowing how to use them over your lifetime. You're constantly learning at both levels. Walk down this way. Okay. So when you have kids in the classroom who have now familiarity with soldering and whatnot, how do your schools look to their future in terms of how these skills, these hands-on skills, can be used in a real-life money-earning situation? I mean, we're not just making rooms by hand. We're not just weaving by hand. We have a huge, huge interaction between all kinds of things, much of which does not require any hands-on at all, except keys, hands on the keys of the computer. Um, I don't complete, uh, you know, uh, I'd like to talk about that with you a little bit. Okay. All right. I think that I think that there is a part of that, but I think that there's also people making stuff and building stuff all the time, and, and it's part of who we are. And and if we're going to be successful, you have to feel the world a little bit. Yeah. The reason why we had such good engineers before and during World War II, because they the engineers were flying the planes. There's a little bit of a difference. You yeah. have to feel it, or else you're going to make some real bad mistakes. Well, it's all right to make mistakes, but when you make real bad ones that could be prevented because you don't have a sense of feel for the world, we're in a lot of trouble. I love to work with my hands, but really? I'm an artist and I can't make any money at it. Period. I can't live on it. I work with my hands because I can't not work with my hands. Okay. I love it, but I can't live with it. So, but you. So, what do you do to make money? Oh, I sit at a computer. You do? Yeah. And does it drive you crazy? No. All right. And that's all right. Okay. <laughs> you know, as long as you keep working in that art, that's good. Who knows? Maybe you make a lot of money with your art someday. Another question, Uncle? Yeah. Sure. I'm actually just going to comment on, on what she just said. If. <clears throat> I'm just going to comment on, on what she said. If if we're teaching kids to use their hands, right, and they end up in a life of running, sitting behind a computer, I mean, I think maybe it's more important that we're teaching them to use their hands, getting them excited about things, and then they go off to a life of engineering, right? They choose engineering, they choose art. And as an engineer, some of being an engineer is behind a computer, but you have you kind of inspired them to choose science or art or whatever they end up choosing by giving them hands-on time. That's, it's not really a question, it's just a comment. Let me um, throw a couple words into this. I, I think that um, the implication that um, if you start out kids uh, with the experience of doing things with their hands, that you've already made a decision about what they're going to be doing for the rest of their lives, um, that's that's actually not quite correct. Um, um, I think the point is that we, we we've now come um, to a point in in this country in uh, educational politics that as a country we're so anxious about the future of the country, about the future prospects of our children, that we're terribly afraid uh, that unless we control everything, and unless we provide all the information that we feel that children need in order to be successful adults, that we're failing the children and that they will turn out to be um, unsuccessful uh, adults. and they'll come back home and live with us and live off of us uh, forever. 
Um, the point is not that you need to be prepared to live a life based on manual skill, but rather that the full exploration of the potential for interacting with the world, which is provided biologically by inheritance, by allowing children to explore physically the environment around them, and to ask their own questions, not academic questions, but the kinds of questions that occur whenever you pick up one object and you try to do something else uh, with another object to it, that, that you try to change it, you try, you try to explore it. Uh, the, other, the, other, uh, the other thing that's part of this, uh, Dale came to our meeting and he said, you know, the thing that you teach kids if you hand them an iPhone that they can't do anything to is, well, this is, this is the way it is, you can't change this. If, if children don't have the experience of being able, out of their own curiosity, to investigate the actual physical world, interact with people, to have discussions about what, what's going on, the way things went on and go on in shops and in sheds everywhere and have been for centuries, more than centuries, millennia, then what happens is you, you raise generations of people who believe that the world simply can't be changed. You have to accept what's there. Uh, this is a much longer discussion than we have time to get involved in now. But, I, but my simple point to the, this lady who's an artist is that um, it doesn't mean because you are giving children experience learning to do things with their hands that that predetermines them to a, a life of manual labor. Uh, what, we, what our experience is is that when you give kids a chance to explore objects, to explore their own capacities, uh, to discover their own interests and their own curiosity, that they begin to take a more active role in their own education. And this is a very, very central point about this educational philosophy. Um, in most schools in this country, the school doesn't care what the kid's interested in. They're not interested at all. They give the kids a bunch of rules about what you have to learn, how you have to behave, and then when you're through with all that, presumably you're, you're a full and competent citizen. What, what drives this educational philosophy is that you can trust kids to make good decisions for themselves if they're acting on the basis of their own perceived self-interest and their own curiosity. And it turns out that um, I actually asked Elliot this question. I said, "Well, maybe you could, maybe you could do a survey. Five years after these kids get out of school, how many of them have gone back home to live at home?" And he said, "We actually did that with one of our schools, and it turns out that we don't have any of our kids who've come back home to live at home. They're all independent. They're all doing things for, for themselves. They're adults. Um, I think that's a big plus. Uh, there are many others as well, but the most important thing is that they are." They've actually discovered something that we call self-determination, and they are taking responsibility for their lives at a very young age. Uh, that's a bit of a soapboxy statement, but I think we're getting close to the we're, end here. We're actually beyond your time, and so we need to stop here. And thank you very much for your questions uh, and your wisdom. Thank you. Thank you.